Okay, um, welcome back. This is week five, In the Weeds, part two. Uh, now we uh, hope to get a little edgier with uh, some of the newer, um, this is a, well, newer and um, perhaps more progressive um, approaches to um, sustainable design, community engagement. A uh, couple of things. Uh, I think one thing hopefully you're going to start to notice is that there is um, there's a lot of return to the way things were historically and uh, this is a crazy looking map um, but I love this map because it just shows over time the fluctuations in population and I think what's really interesting is um, get this guy to do this Here's New York City, and New York City has just been solid, which is really interesting that in terms of, you know, other things affected New York City over time in terms of poverty and crime, but its population has been constant. Philadelphia has had a couple dips. One, uh, back in um, the 1800s, another early 19, um, early uh, 1900s, another in the 40s and 50s, there we see that sort of white flight happening. Um, and then again, uh, war on crime, 70s, 80s, and now you see it leveling out. And actually you'll see if it went on to 1916, it uh, would have gone up. But spend some time, this thing's really fascinating. Um, Detroit's a really interesting one in terms of its meteoric climb as it goes up, up, up. As we get into the Industrial Revolution, it just keeps going, it's doing great, and then it's the 1990s and the crash, and there it goes. And it too is starting to show a little bit of an increase if this went past 1910. Um, but it's really fascinating uh, as you start to kind of go through um, Baltimore, bless its heart, you know, did great. And then it's just constantly going down and down and down and down a little bit of an influx. Um, so, um, you know, as we think about um, different cities, um, I think this idea and this 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 graph is is a wonderful one for you to take a look at so again you know that idea of um the historical evolution of our cities a um, little bit of a, a recap here um, this is andrew ross who gave us a quote from our last one um, and andrew is uh this will be one of your readings and um I'll show the dogs. Ready to be readings right there. The Nature of Cities. Uh, it's, it is by Michael Bennett and David Teague. But Andrew Ross is a sociologist at NYU. Um, and we will be going back and forth to him quite often because I do think he's, he really does help us stay true to uh, what it means to be culturally and socially and racially um, empathetic and, and what that really means. So in this quote, from a cultural point of view, the associations that people have with higher density environments today are ingrained with noxious stereotypes. These associations are the result of a half century of racist propaganda on the part of the suburban lobby depicting the dangers of center city life. But the evidence of the growing taste for post-suburban downtowns is that people are beginning to rediscover the benefits of older forms of urbanism sociability, walkability, cosmopolitanism, spontaneity, and diversity. And so if you think back, look back at that map that we looked at in terms of those fluctuations in cities, start to trace that because I think the pendulum is swinging. And I think this is just always relevant to think about as you're starting to formulate what it means um, to uh, develop a community engaged design philosophy. And I throw this one in here. This is a French tapestry from 1600. It was one of a series of six tapestries 
uh, that depicted the senses. And the thing that was so interesting about it at its time was it was the merging of mythical and uh, religious creatures with a sense of place in humanism in terms of touch, smell, sight. These are 20 by 20 foot tapestries and to have them devoted to these idea of the senses, the human senses, um, and then to be combined with these mythical um, characters was, uh, it was, it was very magical at that time. And I think we're at a similar point now in terms of the merging of these different philosophies. Here it is, uh, Nature Cities. Uh, this is chapter two, uh, which I will uh, upload for everybody to take a look at it. Uh, very, it's, uh, it's a good read. So um, we have been watching this emergence of a perspective for social ecological systems analysis. We'll go back to Rob Fleming's triple bottom line and we're very much seeing and I love his term, the great tent of sustainability, economic viability, ecological regera um, regeneration, and social responsibility. And, and then that idea of the technophilic, the biophilic, eco-design, design build, um, really, uh, I, I think is just, we're definitely gonna start to see this as we move forward and look at some of the other um, aspects of um, what we see in uh, these newer rating systems and programs. Okay, so now we're gonna be taking a look, uh, just a quick overview of where we are um, with week five, Green RAS part two. We'll start off talking a little bit more about the Green Building cert Certification uh, Company. Really interesting that it has taken over in just the last two years, literally mm -hmm. trying to create this umbrella organization that can make sense of all these different uh, certificate programs and really help people navigate that. Then we'll jump into Living Building Challenge, Living Community Challenge, um, extremely progressive um, and stringent and rigorous uh, program, which I think is interesting to look at. Seed Evaluator next, Structure for Inclusion and Public Interest Design, which is all part of Design Corps. Then Well Building, uh, the Well Building Institute, its global uh, perspective, and then um, uh, wrapping up with Green, um, the um, uh, European uh, model as well. So the Green Business uh, Certification Inc. GBCI um, was born out of. Um, one, uh, creating something that could help manage lead, but then also manage this other collection of programs that you see here. So it is the, it calls itself, the premier organization independently recognizing excellence in green business industry performance and practice globally. Um, so um, it, it now has, and it, quite sure how it all worked if they bought it i think they pretty much bought the rights for it but who knows but they exclusively administer project certifications and professional credentials now um, for all of these lead peer uh, international well building institute the sites initiative we talked about sites last time we talked about lead last time um edge uh gresb park smart zero waste uh, and uh, fairly soon if not already I think um, we're going to see Breen come into this we're going to see them all come into here because it just makes sense for one organization uh, to basically administer these uh, certifications uh, it really will, will help out uh, tremendously okay so a um, couple reasons why uh, the uh, Living Future Institute and then it's Living Building Challenge and Living Community Challenge. Um, it's so rigorous. It is more rigorous than LEAD or BREAM. And a lot of that is based on it on two things. One, it's certification is based on actual rather than modeled or anticipated performance. Um, and uh, it is um, not based on a ratings, numerical rating system, the things you must do or mandates, uh, so it becomes uh, a much more rigorous program. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the architecture side on this, it's pretty fascinating, 
I suggest you guys take a look. Bullet Center is probably one of the most interesting. It is considered the greenest building in the world. Uh, it is completely off the grid. Uh, it uh, stores all of its own rainwater uh, for um, uh, domestic use as, and, and for uh, irrigation. They ran into problems um, with health departments uh, not using chlorine, um, a lot of those kinds of things where their practices are so forward reaching. The bank is used to a 30 or 40 year mortgage. They said we need a 250 year mortgage because <laughs> that's how long the building's gonna be around. Um, uh, it is completely off the grid. It has composting for all of its uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty amazing structure. And I should uh, read up on it. Um, but if we look, uh, a lot of the similar attributes or, or mandates or tenants uh, apply to the living uh, community challenge framework as well. Um, healthy for all elements of life, uh, nurturing and generous places that promote healthy lifestyles for everyone. Net positive with respect to water and energy. So example on the solar panels on the bullet set we just looked at, they actually are generating income because they are create, they're making more energy than they use. And so they're selling that back to um, the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so they generate their own energy and they capture and treat all the water they need. So they're completely, completely off the grid. Uh, design using multi-purpose elements. Nothing has a single purpose. Everything has more, multiple benefits to the community and the environment. Regenerative spaces for people and natural ecosystem. The places are walkable, bikeable, and affordable public transportation. Challenge. Um, it has a, a, a. I thought this was probably the best one, and this is um, more for the building. Uh, but I think it's a it's a good one, and it does apply to the community. But it really sort of shows this idea of um, landscape and systems renovations, buildings. Um, and really looking at, you know, their main things, place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, and equity. Um, so we're seeing some terminology used here now that is more around um, social resilience, um, health and happiness. Um, and what's interesting with that one is you're looking at a civilized environment healthy interior environment, well, we've been hearing some things about that, a biophilic environment. Um, so that really becomes interesting when we see this kinds of terminologies coming in. Um, they're big on their materials, their red list of what to not use, um, uh, net positive waste, um, li living economy sourcing, um, really some, some interesting uh, elements in there. Energy, net positive, water, net positive, uh, place, human-powered living, habitat exchange, urban agriculture, limits to growth. So those are, um, I think this more so even than sites, um, there's really uh, uh, some pretty amazing things in here uh, when you start to sort of take a look at this. So um, um, human scale, human places, universal access to nature, and place. Um, so they really start to, um, I, say, I think, explore quality of life in, in the way that uh, Rob Fleming talked about um, the notion of uh, the quadruple bottom line, which is experience and the importance of experience and how that fits into um, uh, uh, um, community engaged design and just an enjoyable place to be. We're going to take a quick look at uh, Rob's lecture on biophilic design. Um, it's interesting, this is also part of the International Living Institute. Uh, here they're really interested in getting away from theory and more into reality in terms of the practice. Um, and um, so I just brought up this web page uh, for them. Um, they realize that there has, they believe it's critical, I think a lot of people do, uh, but there has been a little progress has been made on how to achieve it um, or what it really means. Um, so they're really garnering together folks and people to try to explore this more 
and try to get it into practice so it can be um, codified uh, so that we really can try to figure out what's it mean and what do you, what do you need? Is it more than just a plant next to your desk? Um, is it about light? Is it about other things? Just what all is it about? So um, keep that one in mind um, and it'll be interesting to see how that moves forward. So Design Core uh, began in 1991. Uh, and again, here it's three components, seed evaluator, structure for inclusion, public, industries, um, public interest design. Um, and each one serves sort of a different purpose. So a seed evaluator, also founded in 1991, uh, we talked about what um, these different uh, goals that it has. And in fact, it's going out and finding examples of projects uh, that have achieved this kind of, um, uh, has achieved these tenets for design. Uh, we can take a, a quick look at some of those and what they might look like. Uh, the public interest design is a program held annually um, uh, all across the world, again, looking at examples. So it's a much, it is not necessarily a um, cert certification program as much as it is uh, a group of people who are out there evaluating and looking for best practices uh, that, that apply to the need are, are, are very much at that grassroots uh, level of uh, design build and inclusion. I, I think it would be fantastic if there was not some of the edginess of these projects um, could not be rolled into the messiness of them that makes them so wonderful uh, is or not somehow incorporated into some of these other newer buildings or, or new communities. So I think um, I think that's something to look at when when you think about um, design tenets um, and and how this really starts to uh, starts to work. Um, uh, public interest for design. Um, it is again part of the design core group um, and it is uh, an annual um, conference that really tries to spread the word about some of these different types of uh, grassroots and community projects. Um, and so I think uh, I really appreciate and like what SEED is trying to do. Um, I think that um, that the idea of resources and community and the community of practice is great, but I, I don't think it has to mean that the projects have little funding and aren't somehow incorporated into more of the mainstream aspects of uh, redevelopment and community design. So it's something I think for you guys to think a little bit about is it definitely has qualities to it that are great. Um, how, do we, how do we roll those things together? So the um, second to the last one that we're gonna look at is um, well building. And um, we, we came on this before uh, when we were talking about the CDC study that looked at the quality of uh, the interior environments on people in the workplace and did it have a positive impact? And in, in what we saw was it really wasn't having, it was pretty much neutral. And so a gentleman by the name of Paul um, uh, Sciala uh, in 2009. Okay, so um, two things. One, I showed you seed. Um, as a smaller but very humanistic approach. We looked at uh, uh, Living Building Challenge as that next anti up from lead that really looks at zero carbon, net positive, just really rigorous um, uh, commitment to, to this effort. And, and so now we have well building. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna insert in here um, a little interview with Paul. Paul Ciala um, was one of the top dogs at Goldman Sachs. And uh, he basically saw Lee doing a great thing for the environment and energy 
um, industry, but he did not see it taking care of people um, and really thinking about people and their how well they were doing inside those buildings. Um, and so, you know, he created, um, he's the founder of um, uh, the Wellness Real Estate and founder of the Well Building Standard, um, Delos. And Delos is a platform that includes research, consulting, real estate development, uh, innovative solutions for the built environment. Um, and so uh, what he really did was say, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the doctors and the researchers together with the architects and we're going to really look at what it means to create spaces that nurture and promote health, human health and well-being. So um, Living Building Challenge took the whole thing up. Paul basically said, you've just missed all the important stuff going on inside the building and that's where I'm going to start to focus, uh, which is pretty ingenious. Um, and so it is research-based. Uh, so Delos took uh, science, economic viability, technology, architecture and design, and healthcare, and spent a considerable amount of time rolling all these things together to look at what is human sustainability. You know, what what do people need? And looking at how that intersection between individual human health and well-being and environmental sense, uh, sense sustainability come together. That was. That was his brainchild. And so well building um, uh, since that time has moved into uh, a, just all kinds of stuff. Um, it is free, unlike um, uh, LEED certification. It has levels of certification, uh, just like LEED does. And it focuses on air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind. So. Again, it's really taking this human approach to these aspects of it. And so the idea was by including the best concepts of green technology um, to develop an integrated solution that addresses complete human sustainability. Um, the international, and, and so well building has moved into the international scene thanks to a grant from the Clinton Foundation to create the global initiative. Um, to improve the way people live um, and uh, sharing all this information globally. Now, the thing that is interesting with this, um, uh, and before we jump to the event, not a long time, but Bream um, is our last one that we're going to take a look at. And um, Bream is, uh, uh, was developed during the um, uh, 1993. So Bream, um, go back to this guy, 25 years, it's been, it's been around, it's right up there uh, with LEED. Uh, it is uh, very much global, very much international. Um, uh, it also um, has a third party independent group that creates its um, rating and certification. Its categories are communities, infrastructure, new construction, in use, and refurbishment and fit out. And I guess a couple of things I would say here, communities, it is very much about new community planning and master planning. Um, uh, and so the idea of community-engaged design when it's a new community, new people, uh, I don't think it's quite as relevant to the things that we are working on. Feel free to dive in and check it out. Uh, refurbishment is very much at the building, so it's very comparable to Leeds um, operations and maintenance and refurbishing existing buildings. Um, uh, what is interesting is if you go and check them out, uh, you'll find that you can find out for each one of those standards, technical standards that they have for the US, uh, the only one that's applying right now is in use. Um, everything else doesn't really apply uh, to our country, but they certainly are in all these other countries um, involved uh, in, in work. Um, and so BREAM is, I would say, quite similar in a lot of ways um, to our other projects. I don't see anything that innovative, uh, perhaps in the um, infrastructure, uh, I think we see something 
But what's been really interesting is the most recent thing to happen um, is that uh, the International Well Building Institute, Paul uh, and Bree basically um, have an agreement between the two organizations to align their well building standards with green. So again, we're seeing these two organizations come together. And if you remember, well building standard, uh, it's third party organization that manages it, it, it in the States is the green building um, and, and uh, green building institute. So uh, we're seeing more and more now just in the last, this was November of 2016. So um, I think what, what we're really seeing now, all these organizations are coming together, uh, uh, not necessarily to change, but to make sure there is an alignment of certifications. Um, and so what's the, what's the take home on this and the green morass? I think the one take home is it's been a year since I dived in and checked out um, all of these different um, certification programs. In that year, there have been no new programs, but there has been a combining of certification programs. There's been a willingness to kind of bring the green morass into a place where um, it makes sense for the user where you can really start to look at what the benefits are between them. Um, so uh, we will um, next week uh, look at, I think what I see is the next great level of innovation, but as we're leaving uh, this sort of landscape architecture, architecture um, developer, because you can clearly see a lot of these folks that we've been talking about and these certifications are heavily development and developer uh, driven. A um, couple things that we are seeing, one is uh, rejecting the dated human nature dichotomy and define ecology as including humans. Uh, LAF is the Landscape Architecture Foundation, which had its 50th anniversary this past June. And at the end of a three-day retreat, these were the sort of concluding aha moments that everyone had. The next one was to master charismatic, implementable, resilient, and ad adaptation strategies, um, because climate change will be worse than we realize, uh, to embrace science-based predictive models, understand all strategies in the context of human behavior organiza organizations, to be braver, more radical, we must look upstream, not just follow the money to where it lands, and then diversify our field with big ideas about equity, ecology, and climate. Um, and so for those of you that have looked at the uh, 100 plus change, um, I think what hopefully you're starting to see is as you develop your personal ideology and your philosophy, there are there is evidence out there uh, of successes in different models um, and fragmented. So I think part of your goal will be at the end of this class as you start to have a chance to see what has been possible, uh, where are the gaps, where are the fragments, um, and what you might see pulling together to be that next big idea that someone would give you a hundred million dollars to fix. Um, and so I'll leave you with this because next week uh, we will start off with the wonderful and entertaining Theaster Gates and his Chicago Place Lab uh, because he has um, really started to crack the code on how you get artists and, and, and community members to take ownership working in concert with designers and developers and, and not in the typical paradigm uh, that we've seen in the past of, of the uh, client doing community engagement, really turning that thing upside down and on its head. Uh, so look forward to seeing uh, what you guys think about that. <laughs>